want to um, set up what I'm going to teach on this morning by asking a question. And um, what would you, um, let me ask you this. How many of you would have liked to have lived when Jesus lived and been a personal friend of his and maybe had dinner with him? How many of you would have been there? Let me just tell you, if you don't lift your hand, there's something wrong with, no, I'm kidding. You know what I'm saying? And I realized back then they had, a, I mean, their life expectancy was less than 50 years old and all of those types of things. But you know, when you stop and you think about it, if you were back in, in in Jesus day and you knew Jesus and he was coming by your street and you saw him passing by and it was dinner time how many of y'all would invite him in for dinner I'd I would be like come on down put away the hot dogs get out the porterhouse steak how many of you know what I mean I want to just with that in mind I want to pick up a story in Luke chapter 10 verse 38 through verse 42 it says this, it says, as Jesus and his disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Now we're gonna continue reading, but I wanna just set this up and give us a little bit of an understanding. What we know about this Martha is her sister's name was Mary, we're gonna read that, and her brother's name was Lazarus. This is the same Lazarus that died and was risen, from, that Jesus rose from the dead over in John chapter 11. As you study their life, what you find out is that Jesus was personal friends with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. It's not because I say that, but the Bible says that when Lazarus died, Jesus described, and it describes the situation as they were dear friends or they were close with the Lord. And what I want you to notice, it says, that they were on their way to Jerusalem and they came into a certain village where Mary and Martha and Lazarus lived was a town called Bethany. Bethany was about two miles away from Jerusalem. And so what we see is it describes Jesus and they're walking on their way to Jerusalem and they come in to Bethany where they have friends in this town and they're two miles away. And what I want you to notice is that they stop at their house and they're going to be eating there. But what I want you to realize, and this is, I realize this is my own opinion, but I personally believe that Jesus knew exactly where he was going when he went into that town. He knew that he was going to be eaten with Martha and Mary and Lazarus. He knew, I mean, how many of you before have ever eaten something, eaten at somebody's house that is a really good cook? How many of you know what I'm saying? How many of you know it doesn't take much nudging to get you to reappear on their doorstep again? It doesn't take much nudging for you. Oh, were you inviting? Absolutely. What time? Where? We will be there. This was, if you study, is Lazarus was pretty well to do. He was pretty well. And remember, Jesus is a batch. He's batching it. All of the disciples are traveling. And how many of y'all know batch food and home cooked food is very different? It is, it is really, really different. And so, and, and as I said, my opinion is, is that Jesus and his disciples were probably going down their street and Martha probably realized that, oh my gosh, that's Jesus and goes out to talk to Jesus. They're about 20 minutes from Jerusalem and Martha turns and I could imagine Jesus standing there probably waiting for Martha to say, would you like to come in and eat? And, and so there's, Martha's there and, and, and they're there. And I want you to think about Martha for a moment and realize that she had no forewarning. She is a busy life. And all of a sudden Jesus shows up and he's not by himself, but he's got 12 other grown men, disciples that are gonna be wanting to eat at their house. Now think about this, that you've got Mary, Martha and Lazarus, and then 13 of the other. There's at least 16 people. And if you study this, what you find out is Jesus always traveled with many people. It's, and I, what I want you to think about for a moment is no pressure. There's no forewarning. There's no text. 
Nobody has instant messaged. Nobody has called. There is nothing. And all of the sudden, you are feeding dinner to the Savior of the world and 12 of his disciples. No pressure. How many of you know what I'm saying? And so Jesus shows up, and I could just imagine. Remember back in their day, we could say, I'm going to throw a pizza in the oven. They don't have pizza. They don't have ovens. They don't have restaurants. They, they take organic, literally. Okay, it's called light of fire. Get the fire going. Who's got a chicken or some chickens because there's 16 of them that are here. They've got no refrigerators, no electricity, no running water. And all of a sudden, last minute, you got 16 people that are showing up for dinner. And so you could imagine Martha, she is looking at this whole situation and she's got these unannounced dinner guests. Think about this for a moment. At least she's got her sister Mary to help her. At least, you know, she's sitting there thinking, oh my gosh. Okay, well, at least I got Mary to help me to get this thing together. How many of y'all know where I'm going with this? Is... (laughs) And what I want to do is I want to continue reading in verse 39. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you? that my sister is sitting right over there on her big butt and she is not getting up and helping me and you guys didn't even text, you didn't even call, you didn't even let us tell her to get up and get over here. How many many of you can fudge with me a little bit? You you know what I'm saying. How many, let me just ask you all a question. How many Marthas do we have in here? Put your hands up. Let me ask you a question. Does it torque you when somebody should be helping you and they don't? How many of y'all can feel Martha's veins beginning to... <laughs> you know, how many of y'all can feel Martha just being like, mm, I want to, you know what? Come on up here, Brian. I'm going to have you be Jesus. <laughs> You're Jesus. And we've got Mary right here. Okay. So, when it, so Jesus shows up and Mary's my sister. I'm Martha. Okay. And Jesus shows up and I, and, and I look and I say, you see what's going down here? I'm going to need some help. And so Mary looks at me and says, I'll be right in there. Just give me a minute. So I go in and I'm in there and Jesus is teaching. Y'all are the disciples. Jesus is teaching. And he's over here, and you could imagine after a few minutes, Martha is like, where is she? What's going on? And she comes out, probably peeks out the curtains. No response, no response. And so you could picture Martha in the kitchen. cooking the stuff. She's slamming it around. Oh, 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 that's ridiculous. And finally, she comes out to Jesus and says, do you see what's going on here? She should be with me cooking for y'all. And she's sitting here on her duff. Tell her to get up and get into the kitchen. How many of you know what I'm saying? I want to stay married. I'm not going to tell her. <laughs> okay, sit down, Jesus. You are not. You are not being a good Jesus today. <laughs> Look at verse 41. Now, this is Jesus' response. But the Lord said to her, Martha, my dear Martha, 
You are worried and upset over all these details. <laughs> Easy for you to say, I'm cooking. <laughs> You're upset. Verse 42, there is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it and it will not be taken away from her. How many of you, Martha, that story just rubs you the wrong way? How many of you know what I'm saying? Just how many of you have a really strong right bone and wrong bone about you? You know what I'm saying? That's messing with my right bone and that ain't right. That just isn't right. That's not right. What I want you to notice is I, let me just tell you something. If you are ganging up on a Martha, y'all, we need Martha's. That's right. Because without Martha's, nothing works out. Without Martha's, we're eating Taco Bell. Without Martha's, nothing gets picked up and cleaned. Without Martha's, nothing works out. I believe in reading this story that Martha gets a bad rap. She's getting a bad rap. And what it is, is Mary is sitting while Martha is serving. Let me ask you a question from face value. Is that right? Look, you guys, don't be scared. It's not a trick question. Does that seem right? That doesn't, this just doesn't. Whenever something doesn't seem right, we need to look a little deeper. As you look and, and, and basically Mary is letting her do all the work. Mary is the person that's sitting and receiving while Martha is the person that is serving and doing all the work. And if we look at this story at just a superficial account, we stop and we can leave possibly with the wrong view. But I believe that what Jesus is doing here is he's revealing a balance in our lives. You say, what do you mean by a balance in our life? Do you know that if you read, we just read Luke chapter 10, verse 38. We started in verse 38. But do you know that if you read the story immediately preceding this is in Luke 10, verse 30 through 37 is the parable of the good Samaritan. And the parable of the good Samaritan is all about people serving, helping, and doing. That's what that parable is all about. And at the end of the story, Jesus asks, who is your true neighbor? And it says in verse 37, this, it says, the man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and look at this word, do the same. What I want you to notice is the theme of the good Samaritan is go and do something. But the theme right now that we see with Mary and Martha is Jesus is saying, it, yes, you need to do something, but you also need to learn to sit and receive at the feet of Jesus. Our life needs to be a balance of doing something and personal time with the Lord. If we are all doers and we're not spending personal time with the Lord, we are running on our gas and our life is not being changed. But when we are inspired and we're spending close time with the Lord, what happens is then our doing is in energized by his spirit. See, what we have got to realize is Jesus is balancing this out. And what it is, is that he's saying that you've got to realize, Mike, that the balance of a healthy, overcoming, strong Christian is one that is plugged in and they serve or they receive my word. They go to church and they receive my word. But then equally on the other side is they realize that I've also called them to serve. That is a happy, healthy, healthy, overcoming Christian. Yes. Are you with me today? Yes. I, and, and what it is is, see, as Christians and followers of Jesus, this is what healthy is. This is what overcoming is. This is what being happy is all about. And what I want to talk about today in the title, notice they didn't, they just put that lady over on the corner of the screen. But what I want to do is, is the title of what we're going to talk about today is this, sit one, serve one. 
That's what it, that's pretty much what Jesus said. He said, my kids need to learn how to sit and meditate and receive my word. But then equally is they need to have a servant's heart. This is what a healthy Christian is. It is the balance in their life. See, God wants to bless us because he loves us. But the other side of that coin is he wants to bless us so we can be a blessing to somebody else. I got two people that said that's right. I said, God wants to bless us, y'all, so we can be a blessing to somebody else. That's what he wants to do. That's what he wants to do. See, the Bible says that whenever we water, he will water us. And we've got to have that balance in our heart. Is what I have noticed is this, is that we usually have a bend one way or the other. We got a bend. And what I've also noticed is a lot of times married couples, one of them is the server and the other one is the meditator and getting in. And they get friction going on sometimes. How many of you know what I'm saying? And and what it is, is what I want you to notice is that it's a balance. And what it is, is what makes Christianity so impactful on our world today in the world that we live in is believers that are in love with God. They're in love with his word. They're plugged in to the local church and they're receiving his word. But then equally is they're serving and saying, Lord, make me a blessing to impact the world around me. Lord, make me a blessing so that I can impact the world. See, what makes a great church is when we as Christians know and have a grasp on both of these truths in our life. And what it is, is if my perception of Christianity is I just go and sit in the pew and I don't serve, understand, you can receive God's word into your life, but we're never gonna be healthy in all that God has us to be because we're missing the other part of the equation. We can go to church and say, I'm just a servant and I love to serve everywhere, but we don't take the time to sit and receive God's word. We're going to be lopsided on that side. I remember, you know, that when I got saved, when I committed my life totally to the Lord, as I remember this, um, the, the guy and I, in my, in our house back then is my parents said that one of the criterias for living at home is we had to go to church with them. And I had decided that it was easier to go to church than pay for my own rent and my own food. How many of you know what I'm saying? And so so what happened is, is they would go to this church and and I would go and I remember this greeter and his name was Bub Posey. Everybody say Bub. Bub. He looked like a Bub. Bub was from Alabama. And Bub would tell you he is from Alabama. That's where he's from. And Bub was about, I was, I was probably like 19 years old and Bub was about this tall and Bub had a gray hair and a big gray mustache. And I remember the first time I went to that church with my parents, Bub spotted me coming through the door. And Bub just, all you could see was teeth and a gray mustache. He was smiling and he reached out and he grabbed my hand. His hand felt like I grabbed a cinder block. He was, he was a bricklayer. That's what Bub did. He was a bricklayer and he reached out and he grabbed my hand and, and it was one of those, I had never been hugged like that before. He grabbed me and jerked me in and grabbed hold of me and he was hugging on me and I'm sitting there, this little skinny kid and I'm like, what is this guy doing? And Bub is like, it is so good to see you and he's shaking me and he picked me up off the ground and set me down and he was saying it was so good and Bub was a bricklayer and he had had a belly on him. He's about 15, had a belly, you know, and it was about, I mean, it's pretty good size. And when he grabbed me, I thought to myself, I thought bellies were supposed to be soft. This thing was like a boulder. He <laughs> was bending me in the middle, you know, and, 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 he's, and he's got, the, and I remember he set me down and I said, I said, man, your belly bub, it feels like a muscle. It is hard as a rock. That thing is so hard. And he looked at me and he said, it is a muscle. I've been working on it for a long time. (laughs) And you know, you know, he was one of the nicest guys I ever met. I don't know what the pastor said. I don't remember anything. All I remember was somebody that was serving at the back door 
and they reached out. Some skinny kid didn't know which end was up, being forced to go to church or he was going to have to move out. And he grabbed hold of me. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, this is different. This is different. And I'd sit in the very back, sit in the back corner back there, and I'd just watch them. Man, them people are wild. I'd just watch them. And I remember that I gave my life to the Lord. And you know, I gave my life to the Lord because of people like Bub. Amen. See, it was a servant like Bub. And I think many times what we've done is we have looked at church as a building, as a pew, and as something we go to rather than something we are. That God has called every one of us, yes, to be plugged in, to be in church, be, I mean, receive his word every week, consistent discipline within our life. But then equally, what we see in this story is the balance of a healthy Christian as somebody that has a heart that says, Lord, I wanna serve. Lord, I wanna build your kingdom. Lord, I wanna step out and be all that you have got. And what we've gotta realize in our life is Jesus wants to use every one of us in building his house, in building his kingdom. It isn't about a building, it's about God. That's what it's about. And what we've gotta realize in our life is I believe this whole sit one, serve one, is we need my, you know, as a church, and I, as I stand up here as a church, and, and, and I realize we have, there's over, um, on a monthly basis, over a thousand different people that come to church on a consistent, regular basis. We have right around 300 people that serve in some capacity or another. I wanna tell you something, that is awesome. I wanna give you a hand right now. That is awesome. That is absolutely awesome. But what I see in this story right now is Jesus is saying, healthy is 100%. That's what healthy is. Healthy is when, I'm, when I just stop and I realize, Lord, I'm gonna receive, but I also wanna serve and I wanna give out. Look at this, what it says in Ephesians chapter four, Ephesians four, verse 11 through verse 13. It says, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. These are all, the, what I want you to notice, they're all ministry gifts that function in the church. Now look at what he says in verse 12, is he defines their job description. This is my job description. This is Everybody that is called to be one of those five things that we just read. He said in verse 12, their responsibility, my responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up his church. God said, that's what my job is. You wanna know what my job is, y'all? My job is to give you guys God's word, to equip you to be all that God has for your life, for your heart, and to move into serving his house, his church with all that you are. That's what my job is as a church. And what it is, is I think in America today, what we've done is we've looked at the church as a building. No, a building is where we meet, but the church isn't a building. The church is the people of God. The church is those that are chasing Jesus with all of their heart. And they're saying, Lord, I want you. Lord, I need you. And Lord, I want you to use me to bless somebody, to serve somebody, to help somebody. And what Jesus says is you got the balance. You've got the balance now. That's the balance. You've got it. And what we've got to realize is this is God's plan that we're taught and we learn, but then we do his work and build up his church. I'm reminded of a story. Um, that we, do, we do a small group here on Wednesday night. And, and one of the kind of the things we did in our, our small group is we just went around and said, hey, tell us the story of, of how you came to the church. And somebody um, shared the story. And this was, they said, I don't know, six or seven years ago. And they said that, that they went through some situations in their life and, and they just were like, I just need God in my life. And so they were going around and just visiting churches and our church came on the list. And so they're like, we're gonna, I'm gonna go visit. I just gotta find God. I just gotta find a church. I just need the Lord in my life. And they said that they came, they came through and they said that, that they, there was a greeter at the door by the name of Eric Olofsson. How many of you know Eric? 
Eric is with Jesus. Miriam, his wife, is right here. Eric was a greeter at the door. If you have ever been hugged by Eric, it is like hugging a grizzly bear. How many of you know what I mean? It comes complete with the growl. That's what he would do. Eric, and he said that this person said that, that Eric opened the door and reached out his hand and shook their hand and looked him in the eye and said, welcome home, welcome home. And they said that that touched them so deep in their heart that they've never left. They've been, they've never been here. I mean, never, never been here, <laughs> never left here because of it. And see what we have got to realize in our life is this is the way that the Lord is. This is the way that he moves. And see, that's what we see as healthy Christianity. It is the balance of sitting and serving. See, if one of these isn't happening or gets out of balance, it affects our health spiritually. God is saying that a strong, healthy Christian isn't just somebody who knows the Bible and can quote the Bible and knows all these verses. No, a strong, healthy Christian is somebody who who's meditating on the word, learning the Bible, but they're also applying themselves and saying, Lord, I want to expand your house. I want to build your kingdom. And see, and some people say, well, you know, I'm just really, really busy. And I get that we're all busy, but I want to tell you something, serving the Lord and his purpose in the earth affects us in every way. It affects our heart. It affects our life. You know, I'm reminded how many disciples did Jesus have? You could say it out loud. Not a trick question. There he had 12. Jesus had 12. And then the Bible says out of those 12, he had what he called an inner circle. And there were three. Do you remember who they were? They were Peter, James, and John. Those were his inner three. Do you know what those three did before they came to the Lord? They were all self-employed. They all owned their own businesses. This is what I know about self-employed people. They get to pick their, out, their own hours, but the hours they pick are either gonna be to work the first 12 or the second 12 of each day. Self-employed people are usually the hardest working people because they realize that the paycheck isn't coming from anywhere else. If it is going to produce, they have gotta get it together and work hard and do the best that they can do. What I want you to know Notice is the three that were closest to Jesus were people that were very busy. They had a busy life and Jesus turned to them unapologetically and said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Let me tell you, we can have a busy life, but we are never too busy for the creator of the heavens in the earth. We are never too busy to say, Lord, use me in expanding your kingdom, doing something that has lasting significance and a lasting impact on the world today. And what we have got to realize is Jesus in our life is he saying that my people have got to get this down. You know, when I travel to other countries, many times the African countries, they have this. But in America, what it is is we've got this thing that church is something I go to and I learn from. And Jesus is saying, you've got 50% of the equation, but you've got to be locked in and committed not only to receiving, but also in serving. And when you do that, what happens is is, is you sense me greater in your life. Are you with me today? But he's looking at me like, dude, I don't know if I want to say a word to you. I don't want to say if I, I want to say, I want to look at something Jesus, that Jesus said, and this will be my last scripture, is Jesus was getting ready to go to the cross and to leave the earth. But I want to look at something that he re-emphasized that he had said before that before he's leaving the earth. And it was a lesson that he needed his disciples to get. John 13, verse one through verse seven. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and to return to his father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on the earth and now he loved them to the very end. Verse two, it was time for supper and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. 
Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. What I want you to notice is Jesus' awareness of who he was, his awareness and his identity. He said, I know who I am and I know where I'm going. But look at what it prompted in him in verse four. Because of his awareness of where he was going and who he was and the way God had made him, verse four. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, poured water into a basin, and then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. Realize this, we look at this and say, that's not that big of a deal. The lowest servant in in biblical times in the New Testament was the servant that stood at the door and washed the feet of the people that came in. And the reason they washed their feet is they would take a shower maybe once a week or longer, but because they lit, because their shoes were sandals or they were bare feet, their feet would be caked with dirt. And so when you went into somebody's house and they, it was a normal custom, it was considered mannerly that you had a servant that was at the door that you would sit down and that servant would wash your feet and then you would get up and go into the room. What I want you to notice is this, the savior of the world, the son of the living God is getting ready to be crucified. He knew who he was. He knew that God had made him. And so what did he do? He took on the form of a servant with his disciples and he's saying, guys, you got to get this. Guys, you got to get this. And look at what Peter says. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I am doing, but someday you will. Someday you will. See, one of Jesus' final lessons was we've got to get this serving thing down no matter what our calling, no matter what we do. He's saying, we got to get that down. And as Christians... I love God's word. How many of you love God's word? Oh my gosh. It is like God's word is like, this is his ways. But what we've got to realize is what I believe God is saying is in the world, it's very different than in my kingdom. In my kingdom, the way up is down. The way up is being a servant. That's what he's saying. And I believe today as Christians, let's stand to our feet. Let's stand up. I believe today, as we simply talk about sit one, serve one, that the Lord is saying in our heart and in our life, he's saying, do you have this balance that we see with the good Samaritan and Mary and Martha? Some of you have been looking and you've been like, yeah, Martha, you know, she just really screwed up. No, Martha had a bend one way. And then the reason Jesus put that in there, it's only in the gospel of Luke and he strategically placed it there, is he saying to us as Christians, do you have a balance in your life of where you are receiving? You're, you're receiving, you're plugged in, you're, you're sitting and receiving God's word on a consistent basis in your worship of me, but then equally you look and you say, you know what, I also realize God, that part of this equation is it's not all about me, it's about you. It's about you. And I want to serve your kingdom. I want to build your house. Lord, I want to make you known. I want to make you great. Lord, let me be the bub posy at the door. Lord, let me be the, per the, the person that's in children's church that is just a little guy is there. And, and just because of the influence that I never understood and I never knew that God used me to mold that little guy or to mold that little girl into a great leader because our country needs some great leaders. Our country needs some God-fearing people. Our country needs people who will stand up and say, Lord, I'm plugged into you. I'm gonna receive your word every week, but equally, Lord, I realize that God, you have called me to be a servant. And I realize that maybe in my spiritual walk that that's not something that I've embraced. And you're saying to me, and I see it in your word. And I believe today that God is breathing that over our heart. Are you with me? Are you all with me? 
with me? Hey, I served out a new bowl this morning. How many of y'all are eating out of it? How many of you know what I'm saying? Put a new bowl out there and some of y'all are looking at it saying, that's a different color bowl than I'm used to getting. I don't know. Let me tell you something. If we eat what the Lord serves us, we will grow strong and overcoming. We will grow strong. But when we go up to the cafeteria smorgasbord, you know, I ain't eating that. I ain't eating, just give me the pie. God says, okay, you can eat the pie, but I'm telling you, you'll never be all that I've got. I like the pie, but I also need the broccoli. How many of you know what I'm saying? I need the Brussels sprouts. I need the other stuff too. And we come into our life and we say, yes, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, God. you are better. You're absolutely incredible. And Lord, we're here today because we openly recognize, Lord, without you, life doesn't work. We were created for a relationship with you. And Lord, when that is right, life looks different. It feels different. Lord, problems look different. God, we need you today. We need you in our life. Thank you, God. Everyone look at me for a moment. You know, when you think about Christianity and what it is, I remember from the first 18 years of my life is I had a, an inaccurate view of Christianity. Is my view of Christianity was very simply this, that God wanted me, but he wanted me first to get it together before he would receive me. There was just one problem with that equation. I could never get it together. And so I was just constantly beating myself up and just being like, well, yeah, I guess I'll never. And I remember that I, for the very first time when I realized that Jesus didn't come and say, get it together. He came and said, give me your heart, give me your life, give me everything that's broken, give me everything that you don't understand and invite me to come in and put me first and I will cause everything to move in the right direction. And I remember when I did that is when my life changed. You're here today and you have never done that. You have never come to a place in your heart and in your life where you've said, Lord, I give you everything. Lord, I need you. And I'm asking you, come into my life. Lord, not part of it, not half-hearted, but 100%, I give you my heart. 
I give you my life. See, when we go in a hundred is the only time it works. You say, why is that? Because Jesus didn't give 50%. He didn't give 75%. He gave a hundred percent. It is a mutual exchange. He gives us himself and we give him ourselves. And at that moment, the Bible says we're born again and the Holy Spirit comes into our life. You're here today and you've never given the Lord your heart. Maybe you're here today and you say, you know, I have, but I'm not where I should be. And I know it. I know it. I want to tell you something. God is using me to reach out to you because he loves you. He's not condemning you. That is the devil who's condemning you. He's reaching out to lift you up. That's what he's doing. But I want to pray with you right now. If that is you, let's all close our eyes. I want to pray with you right where you're at. But you can honestly say that right now, I am not where I should be with the Lord. Either I've never given my heart to the Lord or I'm not where I should be and I need to rededicate my life to him. I want to pray with you right where you're at. If that is you, on the count of three, I want you to lift your hand to the Lord. One, two, three. That's you. Just lift it up. Thank you. 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 Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to lead us all in this prayer. And when we get done praying, the Bible says that all of heaven rejoices, throws a full-blown party when any person comes to Jesus. So when we get done praying this, we're going to let out a shout in agreement with what's going on in heaven. Are you with me today? Say this with me, Jesus, I need you. I give you my heart. I give you my life. Help me, God. Help me, Lord, to know you. From this day forward, I put you first. And when I make a mistake, I'm gonna get back up and come after you with all of my heart. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yes. Yes, Lord. Yes. Yes, God. Look at me today. You gave your heart to the Lord. Let me tell you, that is the best decision you've ever made in your life in any area because you just changed the whole playing field. But today you gave your life to the Lord. We want to help you in that decision. We want to give you a Bible. And we want to help you in your walk with him. So if that was you, as we close in just a moment, this portion of the service, I want to encourage you, come on up. Come on up here. There'll be a few of us up here. Or maybe if you're here and you need prayer for any area of your life, I want to encourage you, come on up. We would love to pray with you. Thanks for coming. God bless you. Have a great week. Don't forget that life groups, Wednesday night at the church, several life groups going on. And then equally is that the marriage simulcast is coming. They're going to be giving you cards as you go out the door. Invite a friend and bring somebody. Thank you.